This is the Brisbane Lions Big Footy Podcast. I'm Keggs, and today I'm going to be joined by Ollie, and we're going to talk about why the loss to the Bulldogs was entirely my fault. Sorry for that, guys. Uh, we're going to focus on Dan McStay's game in particular, and then look ahead to Port Adelaide this weekend at the Gabba. Let's do it. All right, Ollie, welcome to the fourth or fifth. I can't remember which one we're up to now, but another loss. I think we might be at five now. Five, yeah. Well, that sort of lines up with round five, so that would make sense. Um, yeah, 32-point loss to the Dogs, but it could have been a very different story. Obviously, we turned it on in the second quarter, but couldn't um, hold on for the rest of the game. Yeah, it was a hard one to review this one because there were just so many promising songs there and just a major step forward for the group, I think, and Fagan spoke about that after the game, but when you're 38 points up, you're always going to be disappointed Mm -hmm. to lose the game, and especially just the margin in the end just got away from us. Yeah, We were so close for most of the game, and then for the league to blow out in basically the last five minutes, Mm. you look at it on paper without watching the game, and you think, oh yeah, the Bulldogs have got away with one there, they probably did it fairly easy, but all those goals came in, yeah, the last probably six, seven minutes, and we had the lead. We were still in front. We are hanging on there for a mm-hmm. while, but, yeah, the, the damn wall sort of just burst, and I think it's one of those things at 40, once you know like you're not going to win, mm. it's um, a bit morale-draining, I guess. But, yeah, really positive signs there. To That second quarter was just unbelievable, and it was just so exciting to watch, and especially against the reigning Premier yeah, under the sure. roof. We just played some of the best footy we've played for a long time. So really positive signs there, but just disappointing we just fell away there at the end. But obviously the dogs are just a, a super side and mm. just too good for us in the end. Um, that second quarter where we turned it on was very reminiscent of the quarter against the, the Suns where we turned it on as well. And everything we sort of touched just seemed to go right for us. And obviously we made the most of our opportunities as well. Yeah. Um, it's just so good to watch us when we're in top flight like that. We know it's not going to be sustainable. Like we sort of, I think you said before, we were prepared for the drop-off after that quarter because we just knew the Bulldogs would come because they're a good team and we're also a young side, so we're going to run out of legs too. Yeah, definitely. And as you said before, we showed signs in the, the Suns game as well when we just had a magical quarter. And yeah. yeah, that second quarter on the weekend, we just didn't miss. I think we kicked the first nine goals without having a behind so mm. that was just incredible to watch and the dogs fans were just stunned in bob murphy's trainer at the game they're just thinking what the hell is this we turned up expecting an easy win and these young lines are giving us a real run for our money so it was really good to watch mm. and there were just so many good signs there obviously our midfield was just really good again beams zorko rocky again just had so much of the footy a lot Steph of clearances Martin. Steph Martin, unbelievable. And to, to take it up to a really good midfield like the Dogs, that, mm. that was really positive. And, yeah, there, there are so many good signs to take out of that. And you said it's not sustainable, and it isn't at the moment because we're still getting used to playing the way Fagan wants us to play and mm. still a pretty young group. But there are going to be days when it is just going to click for us the whole day and we yeah, won't right. have to worry probably about the, the drop-off in the second half and we're going to really have a, a big big day out um as much as we can lord how good the second quarter was i think we do have to reflect on the negatives as well like the bulldogs probably kept us in it with their goal kicking they kicked 17 oh, 20 absolutely and some were absolute sitters and also after half time we kicked two goals three i think it was for the rest of the game um i must apologize to the fans i think that's my fault because i actually got there at half time so perhaps oh, i'm meant no. to the Lions sensed sensed my presence and just caved in, but so I'll take the slap on the wrist for that one. But um, yeah, definitely disheartening in the second half to only kick two goals for the rest of the game. Yeah, there wasn't really much we could do about it. We were just hanging in there, hanging in there. It was almost without obviously getting the win this time. It was almost a carbon copy of the Suns game. We just had that really mm. good start and then just the drop off, and we just seemed to be hanging in there. And yeah. It's just the combination, I think, just being young, new game plan, 
confidence mm. because they do seem to go away from what works well for them when they get that far in front. It's like, okay, we're in this position now and they don't really know what to do with it. Yeah, And sure. I think the Bulldogs can sort of sniff that and, yeah, make the most of it. And as you said, their goal kicking really kept us in the game. That first quarter was just unbelievable. They just mm. couldn't hit the, the scoreboard at all. They were kicking shots out on the full and just absolutely mongrel punts. And mm. it was just unbelievable to see a really classy side like the dogs do that. So, yeah, there, there were some not so great signs there. But I think the good outweighs the bad this time. But, yeah, that's a fair point. Only kicks two goals in the second half. We didn't mm. think we scored about a point in the third quarter. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't great. One of the critical moments I think that rip well and truly stuffed us was, um, I think it was the third quarter. Clay beams marking near enough to the goal square and then handballing to Zorks. Oh, yeah. And that sort of got turned over. I'm not sure if you know Zorks called for it or Clay was just being. You know, a bit, a bit ambitious, but I think that well and truly stuffed us because that was when the dogs are coming and just a nice steady and goal then would have been really good for the composure of the young Lions. But, um, yeah, I think looking back, well, at the time you sort of sensed that was a big miss, but in hindsight that was one that really got away for us. Oh, huge miss to have an easy goal mm. like that when we just couldn't score at all. It just was against the flow and mm. to... Be able to score that goal then would have just been priceless. So to give that up, and it's really deflating when you see something like that happen for the team, the supporters, yeah. and the other team can sense it as well. So yeah, that was a huge moment in the game. I think probably a few interesting umpiring decisions as well, and the the fifty meter penalty. Yeah, with that, the um, Bob Murphy got mm. and put him right in the square, and he was just able to put through the goal. Just got the team up and going, got the crowd up and going, and yeah, it was a yeah, it's a tough good, one for us. It's a good point we might just reflect on quickly. The free kicks were 20 to 14 in favour of the dogs, but I think what you were referring to as well is the fact that the non free kicks, like the Bulldogs throwing out a congestion, like that's been yeah. a bit of a hallmark of the dogs' game. And certainly, I think Jared Berry got picked up for one, which he actually did handball away. Um, yeah, that, I think that was a frustrating thing for mine, was the lack of calls rather than the calls that were there were made, sorry. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of consistency there. You, mm. As you said, Jared Perry got pinged for one and the dogs seemed to be just chucking balls out of nowhere and yeah. being fine. So It's a bit yeah, of an epidemic just, actually in the game as a whole at the moment, the whole throwing situation out of congestion. But um, Yeah, it does, absolutely. And umpires don't seem to be concentrating on that and focusing on it. I think mm. it's just maybe a directive from the AFL just to keep the game going and, and things like that because they do have – areas they do focus on during the season and even mm. the start of rounds, you can sort of pick it from the first game around on a Friday night or whenever you're going to start. So it's um, yeah, it's something that needs to be looked at and think focused on more in the media because it has sort of been just – hasn't really been picked up on down in Melbourne in the, the mainstream media. Yeah. I think I, I – Personally, I love the work Peter Schwab did with our list, but I think he's got his work cut out for him with the umpiring department at the moment. Certainly <laughs> this year as well, isn't there? Haven't been very good performances on their behalf. Oh, it is one of the hardest jobs in footy. So yeah, no, I don't. Definitely I don't does. He's definitely does have his work cut out there. Um, we'll get slightly back on topic now. One of the things we did want to talk about was a really stellar performance from Dan McStay. We'd both been pretty critical of him in the lead up, and I actually speculated that he probably should have been dropped for this game. Um, but I thought, yeah, in defense, I thought in defence he was very, very good chopping off balls and intercepting and combining with um, Harris Andrews really well. He was fantastic and he really stepped up from the week before. He didn't have the best game and was misreading balls and it didn't look like he was doing the team thing. Mm. But I think that's just the way he plays and he's mostly played as a defender during his junior career and probably... Mm during his career at the Lions as well. He has gone forward at times and really made a good impact. But, yeah, his game on the weekend was super. And, yeah, we were both probably think he might get dropped. But, mm. you know, Fagan's stuck with him for another week and he, he's really delivered and his performance is a really positive sign for us. Yeah, for sure. I think one of the noticeable changes I noticed was instead of going for a hanger every time, those 
hanger attempts, I guess you call them, turned into spoils. So it's being yep. the more, you know, the team first sort of focus, I guess. But um, even his disposal, that was one of the, you know, things that let him down against Richmond. But I thought that was really good, bar one costly turnover late that probably sealed the game for the Dogs, handball through the centre of the ground. But yeah, really positive signs there with the combination of him and Harris are, are starting to form. Yeah, for sure. And they're only going to get better throughout the season. And I think playing that he had perfect conditions under the roof. I mm. think the week before, it wasn't just Mick Stay turning the ball over. It was an epidemic no, on that's the fair. ground. Most players were just butchering the ball and mm. it was really one of our uh, falling failings there. So, yeah, he was, he was much better. And I think him down there with Harris, they're going to form a really solid combination years to come. Um, switching to the other end of the ground, this is something that's going to be debated for probably f- for a long time f- for us Lions fans, is Eric and Josh and what they bring to the team. Um, I suppose we'll start it off by talking about which who do you prefer to have in your team if you were to pick one? Oh, I mean, it's I mean, a we're fortunate, one, it? We're fortunate we have both, so... But, yeah, um, we've got both, mm. but... On this year's form, you have to go with Hipwood. Yeah, for sure. You have to go with Hipwood. We were probably critical of him last week as well. Same with Nick Stade. Mm. That he looked, I don't know, maybe he was getting a bit ahead of himself. But mm. that first half on the weekend, he was just absolutely sensational. And he was getting back to the form that he was showing late last year and then the, the first couple of rounds <laughs> as well. Yeah. And probably not, not completely his fault, but he was out of the game in the second half but mm. yeah the dogs were controlling the game so yeah Hipwood definitely at the moment and yeah Shaki, I don't know he hasn't had the best start of the season obviously the injury yeah. early hampered his run into the season then had a had an okay game against Richmond oh, but yeah. yeah he's been okay and I think he'll only get better as he gets that fitness up and probably just lacking a few opportunities at the moment. And it is so hard just with a young forward, mm. and especially in the second year as well. Yeah, and he'd be taking the best defender from the opposition. So that's why I think we do need like a Michael Close just to give him a bit of a chop out. Oh, he's got to come back in. We're just going to start a campaign to get Closey back in. Yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah. It's, oh, I was stunned that he was dropped in the first place and now that he's spent time in the, the reserves, I, I don't understand why he's, he's out of the side. I know... Modern footy, you don't probably want to have three big guys in that forward line, but mm. since they are so young, and yeah, you, you, they need to have a chop out. Um, the other thing that's impressed me about Josh is he's actually working up the ground pretty nicely and getting a few marks on the wing and even half back as a sort of target for us, which is good. He's not sort of you know sulking or stuck isolated in the inside fifty like you know sort of like we have seen with Hipwood. When he's had his off days, he sort of can't get into the game, whereas Josh at least works hard and works up the ground to get into it. Um, in terms of output, obviously, this year, Eric has been superior. But I think that's mostly just down to his attributes. Like, Eric can use his speed, whereas that's obviously yeah. something Josh doesn't have the advantage of. Um, yeah, long term, you know, I'm still backing Josh to be a really, really good player for us. But I think Oh, it, so am I. At this stage, while both of them are still growing into their, their bodies, um, that's one attribute that Hipwood has that can keep him in games and make him exciting and give him a point of difference over his defenders. Do you think the contract negotiations there may be playing on his mind? <clears throat> because I, I've seen a bit of talk on Twitter and, and social media that he doesn't look quite as focused as he did last year and maybe yeah, his, his mind's wavering a bit just with the contract negotiations. Obviously, he wants to put it off until later in the year and not talk mm. about it. Yeah, it's a good point. Like, players always say, you know, it's I just want to focus on playing, which doesn't seem to correlate into their performance. Um, there was something we noticed with Louis Taylor last year as Lions fans. He's yeah. struggled a bit, but Louis actually has been really good this year for us. Oh, he's been great. Um, yeah, you'd think he probably does have something to do with how he's playing at the moment. But um I'm I don't know how you feel about this, but I'm personally pretty confident he sticks around. Oh, I'm very confident he'll stick around. Mm. Um and I think in terms of if we're looking at the importance of Eric versus Josh, I think long term for us, Josh is the important one. 
because it shows that if we can retain that high talent, we're on the right track. That's obviously something we've struggled with in the last few years is retaining, you know, our good players and our early picks. So I think that will send a message to not only the club, but to the rest of the competition that we're on the right track and we're moving forward in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. And um, there's a few people thinking he's gone, but I mm. can't say that at all. And he has that connection of the club with his late father and mm. he parried for the club growing up. So I know he grew up in, in Victoria, so there's maybe a lure to go back home, but I think he's pretty settled in Brisbane. The club's done a really good job at settling him in and stayed with the merits last year for the early yeah. part of his time there so no, I can't see him going anywhere I think it'd just be a formality it's one of those things you I know they it's, it's a difficult one because I can see where the manager's coming from that they want to put it off until the end of the season and mm. not have to worry about it but it does get made a talking point in the media and that has got to have an impact on your footy and you out of contract all this speculation around and yeah. you know, I think it's probably better to get it out of the way if you can and probably something that the Lions deal with as opposed to other clubs or maybe other interstate clubs deal with this as well. But I've noticed the fans start to turn on him, turn on him a bit as well. Like Louis Taylor, his reputation definitely has suffered since his contract stalling last year. Oh, yeah. Like he was definitely. a fan favourite for the first few years and he was electrifying when he kicked a goal. Sammy and, Mays as well. Yeah, for sure. And I think, yeah, it's definitely hurt their perception. I hope things don't go that way for Josh. Like, it would be good if we woke up tomorrow and he'd re-signed, but that's probably not going to happen. But, um, yeah, I think... Yeah, yeah. you're right. You're dead right. I think some of the the talk, it's just unavoidable. There's mm. going to be... There were stories coming out that Louis Taylor was gone. He was getting these big offers elsewhere, and mm. the fans were just like, oh, okay, another one's gone. And even yes. though <laughs> there was probably nothing to it, really, yeah, he's, as... he stayed, he signed... As fans, but, yeah. we sort of tend to check out mentally from players when we get that speculation or if they're, you know, hel- holding off contract talks till the end of the year. But, um, yeah, I think as fans, we just need to understand that's the market at the moment, and especially with a new um, bargaining agreement coming out this year. That was always going to happen with player contracts across the, the league. So, yeah, I think the messaging just needs to be, you know, be patient, we'll be right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, well, let's look ahead to Port Adelaide this weekend at the Gabba on Saturday, I think it is, Saturday afternoon. Um, they have confirmed Travis Boak will be out, so that's a bit of a win for the Lions. Um, I suppose we'll start with changes, team changes. Do you see anything for us? Well, surely close he's in. We're pushing for him. <laughs> we need him in there, so, yeah, yeah definitely coming in, and well, I hope. Darcy Gardner really also last week was a late withdrawal, so depending on what his status is, he could be another to come in. Yeah, I'd I'd probably have him in at this stage. Mm. Port Adelaide's got a pretty dangerous sort of forward line, and I think he could match up with... He, he's really good, Darcy, because he can play on the tools, he can play on the smalls, and mm. I think, yeah, we really need to have him in there this week. So if he's fit and ready, mm. then we've got to play him. So those are two names that we've thrown up. Who would make way? Ooh, tough one. <laughs> I don't really know at this stage. I, I throw one up there, Jared Berry. He's had three games. Now, like, I don't think he's been bad, but I think it's just no. a learning or an educational thing for from Chris Fagan. Like I noticed at Eddie Head on the weekend, he actually had a few centre bounce attendances. So I think yeah. it'll just be part of his education and learning the structures and now... Fagan will say to him, look, go back to the NEFL for a few weeks, build on what you've learnt and the structures that we've got in place, and then we'll, you know, bring you back with a few in a few more weeks. So he might be one that I'll speculate and throw up there. But um Ben Keys, who was the late inclusion for Gar- for Darcy, I thought was pretty good. Oh, he was really good. I he didn't do much wrong at all. Kicked that great goal in the second quarter. Great goal. Really had us up and about and Oh, he's going to be a fabulous player, Ben Key. So, yeah. yeah, he'd be very unlucky to lose his spot if he did. Mm. So, yeah, it's it's really hard to <laughs> pick anyone at this stage. Yeah. I mean, Liam Dawson got beat pretty comprehensively early, and I thought he fought back well. 
but definitely yeah. early on he was struggling. I'd be surprised if Fagan said to him after one game, you know, yeah, see you later. I think part of the messaging is, you know, you get consistency with games at the moment. You'll get a good run in the side. So I think we've got to keep Mick Luggage in there as well. He did some great things <laughs> yeah, his on goal the weekend. Awesome. And he just really looks like he's settling into life as an AFL footballer. He was probably a bit hesitant as he can be mm. in your first couple of games, but I thought he was superb yeah. in a few of those plays in the second quarter. He was he was really good. I completely agree. And even though I made the case for, you know, Barry having a spell after after a few games, I think it's probably the opposite with McCluggage because he's actually been yeah. building pretty nicely with each game he's played. So you need yeah. to keep him in there. I suppose Cedric Cox was another one as well of the younger guys, but I think he had some really exciting moments and good chase down tackle on centre wing was a highlight. But um, yeah, I am actually can't decide who would be another change. Maybe Clay Beams, but again... Yeah, he, Clay Beams, I said maybe last week. and Yeah, yeah he didn't set the world on fire on the weekend, but he did do some <clears throat> okay things as well. But yeah, yeah, I think he might be might be on the cusp. Mm, he was pretty solid, and I think in that same sort of bracket of solid but not sp- spectacular would probably be Bastanak and Harwood. Yeah. But um, Port, obviously, it's a doubly interesting game from our point of view because we have Port's first pick next year in the draft, and as much as we've been death-riding them this year, it probably hasn't gone as well as we would have thought. Port have, <laughs> Port have looked all right as much to our chagrin. Yeah, they've been looking okay, and we'd love to see them drop heaps of games and mm. fall down a ladder, but so I don't think, think it's going to happen. They're really rebounded after a poor couple of years, and obviously Ken Ingley's job is probably on the line if they have another bad season. Yeah. So, so as you mentioned before, Travis Boak out, so Ollie Wines will captain. Mm. and Yeah, he's been terrific. He's one of the best midfielders in the comp now, and... We just need to put in a good showing because that performance late last year at the Gabba, that was just simply embarrassing to get flogged by a team that didn't play finals. Mm -hmm. And we all hate Port Adelaide going back to 2004. (laughs) We've got long memories, so we just hate losing to them any time. But that performance, that was right up there with some of the the worst 40 I've seen as a line supporter. So Mm -hmm. we really need to atone for that. But... The year before that, we went in underdogs, Port Adelaide was going okay, and we were able to get the job done at the Gabba. Yeah, that so. was a really good win, actually. Yeah, that was one of the best wins under Lepic, so... Mm. I think from memory, Dane Beams turned it on that day. He did. He really, really did. Um, so I suppose before we sign off today, what are some things we need to focus on for Port this weekend? They're coming off, we just, actually, we should mention, a 90-point win over Carlton. Mm. Who, Carlton, you could... It wouldn't be unfair on us to say we'd probably be bracketed in in that sort of area of the ladder with Carlton. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess what are the things we need to work on or be aware of from a Port Adelaide point of view? Uh, we need to make a fast start, mm. especially against Port Adelaide, because they're one of those sides that can really get a run on. They did that against Carlton on the weekend. If they mm. get a bit of confidence up, they're one of those teams that... <laughs> are really, really dangerous. So if we can keep them in check early mm. and just get off to a good start and just make sure we're just focused and in the game. The performances of the Gabba, we've, we've sort of played better away from home in yes. recent times than we have at the Gabba. And I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something that's worried me this year is our Gabba performances, yeah. which is something I thought would have been a strength of ours, you know, wanting to mm. defend that home ground and making the Gabba a fortress, but it has left a lot to be desired for this year. Yeah, it is. Like, apart from that, uh, probably one and a half quarters against Essendon, we yeah. <laughs> haven't really been great at the Gabba this year, so... We really need to make sure we're, we're focused, turned on, ready for their attack on the footy because that midfield is pretty imposing. So mm. if we can get on top of the midfield, if Beams, Zorko, Rocky, Steph Martin in there can get on top, shut Ollie Wines out of the game, then obviously Travis Boat going out really helps our cause. Mm. So then some of their small forwards as well, like Jarman Impey, um, Aidan Johnson popped up pretty well last week on debut and... Yeah, obviously, Chad Wingard's a really good player as well. So mm. they have so many pretty exciting players that can get up and going. So we just need to be able to keep them in check. Yeah, I think the main one that we'll need to be wary of is Robbie Gray. And I think someone like a Darcy, if he comes back, is a pretty good matchup for Gray forward of the ball. If he goes into the midfield, 
you know, you might look at Robinson doing a sort of shutdown role like he did with Dustin Martin and com- those two combining to shut him down because Robbie Gray's yeah. been in pretty good form this year. Like Likewise, Ollie, sure has. Ollie Wines. Um, I think, yeah, just cutting off their speed as well. Like Port Adelaide, a really quick side, which is, again, something that worries me because we've been sort of cut up by a few quick, quicker sides this year. Um, but, yeah, look, I think... Personally, I'm just asking for a competitive performance. I'm not too hopeful, but I'm happily supporting any loss Port Adelaide takes this year <laughs> for the better of our draft pick at the end of the season. Well, I'm always supporting a Port Adelaide loss, so mm, yeah. it doesn't matter what year it is. <laughs> I'm always call, happy mate. to see them go down. Yeah. Um, all right, mate. That's probably all for this weekend. We'll, um, we'll do it all again next week. All right, thanks, Keg. So hopefully we're speaking after a win against Port. That's right, mate. See you then.